issue of anxiety and worry. And in this series, we began with looking at three illustrations that Christ gives to us, three illustrations that are vitally important because they're contrasting illustrations. The first one is, where's your heart going to be? Is your heart and your treasure going to be um, in heaven? Or is your heart and your treasure going to be here on earth? The second illustration that Jesus gives is the difference between light and darkness. Are we going to walk in light or are we going to walk in darkness? And then the final illustration that Jesus gives is you cannot serve two masters because you're going to love and despise the one or you're going to then hate and be loyal to the other. And it's kind of a very mixed up language there that's fascinating to see that when you try to serve two masters, you have this duplicity and you get torn apart. And then Jesus says in verse 25, therefore, do not worry. Therefore, do not be anxious. And he uses the word therefore in a very unique way. And, and it's kind of two, it's not the normal therefore Greek word, it's the, a, a compounded two words that are, are fascinating because of this. Because of the fact that you can't serve two masters. Because of the problem of having a treasure in heaven and then a treasure on earth, if that's where your heart is. Because of the problem of trying to be light and darkness. Because of this, Jesus says, do not worry. And I believe that what we find, and that, that's a, a present imperative there. That means a continual command. I'm going to come back to that in a little bit today. But, but what we see here is a vital important issue when Jesus says, do not worry. He's saying, hey, listen, you can't be pulled in two directions. And that's literally, according to word study, what the word means, worry, is to be pulled in two directions. And then Jesus goes on to give us five questions, five questions to work through the issue of worry in our hearts and in our lives. And now today, after the five questions are done, because we've gone through all five questions, we now come to some summary analysis and the answer that Jesus wants to give us. And the answer will continue, not next week, because Pastor JJ will get a shot to preach. So um, he hasn't preached for a few weeks, so I'm gonna, we're going to have him preach a little bit um, here and there now. And so it will be in two weeks. But in two weeks, we'll come back to, but seek first the kingdom of God. And we'll see how that's set up. Do you realize that the concept of seeking is really set up in verse 32 about what the Gentiles seek? And then it gives a contrast again between what the Gentiles seek versus what we should <laughs> seek. And so today we want to look at the omniscience of God, that God knows everything. That God knows all. He's completely <laughs> omniscient. And the truth of God's omniscience should have a direct impact on the issue of anxiety in our hearts and in our lives. So today we're going to cover actually two verses. You turn with me to uh, the book of Matthew and chapter 6. We're going to look at verse 31 and 32 today. Therefore, do not worry, saying, What shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. Thank you, our Father, for this text. The reminder of who you are. <coughs> for Lord, if we forget who you are, we end up and tend to embrace worry. But when we really embrace who you are, Father, we recognize that that takes much of our worry away in and of itself. Help us to follow your word and to really believe these truths in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you'd asked me last Sunday what I would be doing on Thursday and Friday, I would have been glad to tell you. I would have told you, well, Thursday is uh, <coughs> grandkid day. <laughs> we had... Uh, uh, Hadassah and, and Vera and 
uh, Adam James over uh, overnight, so we had him on on Wednesday and Thursday. And I told you that's going to be a great day. We got mm -hmm. we got grandkids that day, and we had another grandkid on Monday. We went there to that house, so we've been doing a lot of grandkid stuff, and uh, that makes me always happy. So if you want to see a smile on my face, just ask me about grandkids. Um, and then I would have told you, well, Friday's a work day. I have I have a packed work day, so I had kind of put a lot of things that I wanted to accomplish. And um, so I had sermon prep, I had other prep, and I had other things that I had all designated for Friday, and I had it kind of all worked out. And, you, you know, I, I'm glad to tell you I'm one of those guys I like to have my ducks in a row, right? So I could have told you what my week was like. I could have gone from, from, from uh, you know, Monday all the way through back to Sunday and told you what I was going to be doing. Well, that wasn't true, because Tuesday we had a storm. And the big oak tree or a portion of the big oak tree came down from my neighbor's yard into my yard and we had a mess. And so what do you think I was doing on Thursday and Friday? <laughs> Cleaning the mess. <laughs> you know, that's a really good illustration of understanding how this text relates to us. Because a lot of times what we're trying to do is we're trying to figure everything out. And we'll come to the end of our series on worry and anxiety. We'll come in verse 34 to see that Jesus says, listen, don't be worried about tomorrow because tomorrow has enough worries of its own. And so God wants us to focus in on today. God wants us to take up our cross daily. That means today. God wants us to take up our cross, Luke 9, 23. Take up our cross today and live for Jesus. And when we get caught up with all the worry about tomorrow, what happens is that takes away from the power of today. And so I couldn't have told you really what I was going to be doing a week ago. But I can tell you, after a week, what happened, right? And I'm not worried about that anymore. Of course, when I first saw the tree in my yard, I was like, oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> I would pulled out my chainsaw in a while, you know. Unfortunately, my neighbor helped out, and he had his chainsaw, and he has a great saw, so, you know, everything worked out really great. But it's not worth worrying about. Can you imagine trying to worry about every tree that might fall? That would be crazy. And, and this is what Jesus is trying to say. God knows that. God knew the tree would fall, but I did not know that. God knows what problems you may face this week, but... You don't need to know them. And so he starts with a reminder of what he said in verse 25. And so as we come to our first point, we want to look at the anxious. And that's a direct quote from most translations from Philippians 4. We'll talk about that in a moment. The anxious. And then we'll, we'll look at, secondly, um, as we move from Jesus giving the anxious and what happens as a result of being anxious... Then we'll look at the analysis, the analysis of don't do that because that's what the heathens do. That's what the Gentiles do. That's what, if you want to put it into the Christian context after the cross, that's what the unbeliever does. The unbeliever does that. The believer in Jesus Christ shouldn't be doing that. And that's the analysis that we have been given from the Word of God. And then finally, we'll come to the answer that the Father knows our needs. And we'll look at the amazing truth of an omniscient God and what that means for the Christian in their life. But in this first point we see, therefore, Jesus says, do not worry. Do not worry. It's the same word we've been looking at. This is the fourth time, so we've looked at it already three times, so I'm not going to repeat a whole lot of what I've already covered on this word. Uh, but one, one of the things we haven't talked about is in Philippians 4, verse 6, it's translated in most translations, do not be anxious. And interestingly, it's translated, do not be anxious, in, um, in Philippians 4, the same way it's translated in verse 25. We looked at that from the very beginning in verse 25, that pivotal verse where Jesus says, therefore do not worry, and he gives a command there. The rest of these aren't commands because he's already given the command. So he doesn't repeat the command. This word worry is not put in a command form or an imperative form, but it's put in a form for us to really wrestle with. And so we know what Jesus' command is, and he says um, uh, a fourth time, therefore do not worry, saying, and this is what happens when we worry. We get caught up in a lot of things. Now remember, the worry is used um, 24 times. 
six times in our text, from verse 25 through verse 34. And then it's, we've looked at different contexts in which the word is used, worry is used of Martha. Martha, you worry about so many things, remember that? And then we looked at it in a more of a positive context two weeks ago, where it was about our cares, our, our cares for, for our spouses or our care for Christ, and looking at the whole concept of this particular word. But even in that context, it has this idea of being pulled in two directions. And so what happens when we're pulled in two directions? What happens when darkness and light gets kind of mixed up in our life? What happens when we're treasuring something here on earth, but we know we should treasure things in heaven? What happens when we start serving things here on earth? Or mammon, earthly things, rather than serving God. And Jesus, therefore, do not worry, because this is what you're going to do. You're going to start trying to figure it out. Saying what? What shall we? What shall we? What shall we? Three times. Clark says this concept of three times means that they've been engrossed in the process. They've been kind of engrossed. They've been caught up in the process. And Jesus says, stop doing this. Stop getting caught up in the process. What shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? Or you put it in. What, what is it for you? You know, where shall I work? Remember the word what can mean who, what, where, which. In the Greek. So, in other words, you know, where am I going to work? How am I going to pay this bill? What am I going to do about this car repair? How many of you felt that way, right? <laughs> Isn't that amazing? We've all experienced that car repair that we just like, I wasn't prepared for that. And we can get so caught up in this, what, what shall I? What shall we? And, and Jesus brings it one, two, three, three times to kind of help them to understand now I want to turn to another text. Like I said, 24 times this word worry is used. But it's translated one time as anxious. And that's in Philippians 4. If you have your Bibles or there's Bibles under the, the chairs there, uh, turn with me to Philippians chapter 4. And I want, to, I want to start in verse 6 and go all the way through to verse 8. But Philippians 4, verse 6 um, through 8. Be anxious for nothing. And again, this is an imperative, so it's a command, and it's a present imperative, which means it's a command that continues. It's a command that was true yesterday, a command that is true today, right now, and it's a command that will continue on tomorrow. And that's vitally important to understand. You know, sometimes we don't kind of get that in the English language, but, but it's there. It's there in the scripture. This is important. Paul says, be anxious for what? Nothing. Ouch. That, that's, that's what really gets you, doesn't it? Philippians 4, verse 6. Be anxious for what? Nothing, but in what? Everything. Now, let me tell you right now, me, the major problem with the issue of worry is we have something we want to hang on to. It, it, it could be an issue of, of health. It could be an issue of wealth, and you can go on and on. It, it, you know, there, there's something we want to hang on to. And when we hang on to that, that ends up eroding into worry in our lives. And so it's essential to see this text for what it says. Jesus says here, do not worry. Paul, through the inspiration of the Spirit of God, says, do not be anxious. Now, if you're invested in pharmaceuticals and people were to all become believers and start applying the truth of God's word on anxiety, you might find that you lose a lot of money. <laughs> because pharmaceuticals are getting rich over anxiety. And quite frankly, you now don't need to even really be diagnosed with a problem of worry. You just need to go to your family doctor and tell your family doctor, well, I'm struggling. You know, I'm a little depressed. I'm a little worried. And they'll just write you out a script. And you make the pharmaceuticals rich. And I recognize that there are, are chemical issues, and I'm not talking about that, and I'm not trying to get into that aspect, but I'm talking about there is not a person on this planet that doesn't struggle with worry. 
There's not a person that might not really one day just want to take an anxiety pill, if you want to call it that. <laughs> Different than an antidepressant, but it's part of what happens, right? And, and my point is, is that we have something in Scripture that reminds us that do not be anxious, but in everything. So what do we do in everything? Let's go back to our text, uh, the, the secondary text. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God shall guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. You see that? And the peace of God shall guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Do you know what cancels out worry? The peace of God. Now we have peace with God. We find that in Romans chapter 5 and verse 1. That because of the cross and the work of what Jesus did, if we believe in Jesus and the work of the cross, we have peace with God. Jesus also tells us we're that peace in our life. So that's what happened when we got saved. We were born again by the grace of God. And through the love of God, we embrace the gospel. And now we are at peace with God. But you know what? You need to be in Christ. Jesus makes it very clear in John chapter 16 that in me you have peace. So we have peace with God. We have peace in Christ. And now that's supposed to produce the peace of God. The peace of God. I want to share with you, I've been talking a little bit about our marriages from time to time, particularly recently, and hitting you with marriage stuff. But let me just hit you with another one. My first marriage to Rhonda, who passed away after 22 and a half years of marriage, but my first marriage with, with Rhonda started off really rough. We really struggled. Uh, we, our first five years of marriage, we, we really had a lot of ups and downs. And we fought a lot. Or sometimes we just didn't fight. I would just walk away, but she wanted to fight, and then she would be done, and I would be like, ha, you know? And it was just this very, very difficult thing. And we fought over the stupid things, little things. And just like we constantly were at battle with each other. It, it could be, you know, and, and being in, in pastoral ministry, we didn't have a whole lot of finances, so that was a big one. We fought a lot of that money. And, and you know, um, and, and I, I, I kind of felt like, you know, Rhonda, you want me to be the leader of the home, but every time I try to be a leader, you, <laughs> you have a problem with me. And we just kind of went and battled and battled and battled. And I was studying as a pastor. I was um, uh, uh, preaching in a series and studying and wrestling. And I realized, you know, I'm, I'm handling my marriage wrong. I'm trying to handle my marriage like the leader and, and take charge rather than handle my marriage like a leader who lets go. Mm -hmm. What a difference. <coughs> you know, we're, we're, we're told as, as elders not to lord it over the flock in 1 Peter chapter 5. We're not to be lords over the flock. We're to lead by what? Our example. And if you ch check back to chapter 3, it talks about submission and living with uh, the wise submission and the, the husband living in an understanding way in verse 7 with his wife. And you know what? The problem is often what happens is we point the finger at the wrong time and tell the wife, you're supposed to be doing this. And the wife says, yeah, but you're supposed to be doing this, right? Doesn't that happen? And that was what was happening to, to Rhonda and myself in our early marriage. The Lord convinced me that I was trying to make the decisions as the ruler of the home rather than letting God now I, I'm not saying the husband shouldn't lead that's scripturally based but it doesn't mean that the wife isn't an equal partner because that's what first Peter 3 is saying and that's what first Peter 5 is saying about the flock that just because I'm a shepherd doesn't mean that you aren't equal participants right mm. and, and so it, it's a partnership amen Marriage is a partnership. The church is a partnership. My gift isn't any more important than the gift you were given. And, and we are all given gifts. And so here's the vital point. 
I learned something in studying this. I learned that I was making the decisions rather than recognizing that I was a partner. And I took leadership and asked my wife, Rhonda, my first wife, Rhonda, appealed to her. I said, honey, why don't we apply verse 7 of Philippians 4? And before we make any decision, let us rest on the peace of God. And if you have peace of God and I have peace of God, we'll know that we can move forward. But we'll have to pray, right? And we'll have to wrestle with it. And we'll have to do all these things in order to be able to have the peace of God. And it's amazing. Our marital relationship radically changed by that one little thing. Every time we had to make a decision, small or big, rather than fighting about it, we decided to pray about it. And we continue to pray about it until God's peace directed us. And it changed our marriage. But it changed our spiritual life too. It changed my understanding of what it meant to be a leader in the home. You know, being a leader in the home wasn't forcing my wife. Being a leader in the home was joining, the two of us joining in the truths of the Word of God and applying it to our marriage. And something beautiful came out of that. I can't take credit. <laughs> Not at all. Why? Because I blew it for five years, right? <laughs> Not only did I blow it for five years, it was always there in the Word of God and I knew that truth. But I praise God for His Holy Spirit that convicted me and brought some unity to our marriage. Didn't mean we never fought after that. I mean, we had a very different course of action to take. Now, I'm not done yet. Remember, it says, be anxious for what? Nothing. It's a command. It says, but, in prayer, in a thankgiving attitude, let your requests be made known, and the peace of God will guard your hearts and minds. Then look at verse 8, <clears throat> finally. See, I think this is a wrap-up of verse Six and seven. There's some commentators that disagree with me. That's fine. You can disagree. But I think this is a clear wrap up. As you know, you can't just do and just pray, but you have to guard your mind now too. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, if there is anything uh, praiseworthy, meditate. That word literally means think upon. Think upon these things. Wow. We have not a formula. We have a living spirit, a Holy Spirit within us, through the Word of God that gives us clarity and direction in how to handle anxiety. If there's a biochemical issue, work with that too. But don't just work with that. Your primary responsibility as a Christian is this. How does God want us to respond when we are anxious? First, we better pray. Can we all say amen? Amen. We should pray. Anxiety <laughs> is a call from God to prayer. I can't read... Philippians 4, verse 6, any other way. It's a command that's directly connected, first of all, to pray. That's what we do. That's the action we take. That action goes to an attitude. That attitude is thanksgiving. Boy, this looks very different than some of my prayers when I'm anxious. Some of my prayers when I'm anxious really go to battle with God, and I love to take the lament psalms and say, see, I'm doing what the, uh, the, the, the psalmist is doing. And that, that's fine in and of itself, as long as you come to the conclusion of many of the psalmists. But the reality is, is, is lamenting is an important part of the Christian life, but even in our lamenting, think of how often the psalmist comes back to giving thanks to God. Thanksgiving is a heart attitude. A lot of worry that turns into prayer has nothing to do with that kind of grateful attitude toward God. And we need to remember that. We, re we need to remember that God does want us to lament, but he wants to bring us back to this attitude of thankful hearts. With thanksgiving. That's so essential, isn't it? So we need to pray. That's our action, right? We need to have, secondly, an attitude of thanksgiving. And then... 
We need to ask. We need to ask. Now, that's kind of strange because in a moment, we're going to look at a verse that says, God already knows before you ask. So, I've had people literally ask me, why ask if God already knows? Well, just think of your children. You already know what they need, but you still want them to ask. And our Heavenly Father wants us to go before the throne of grace in times of need and ask for His help. Ask for what we need. It's a part of a relationship. It's a part of a relationship. It's a part of gratefulness, too. Now, I couldn't alliterate all the way through, but I got three for you. First of all, that's the action, right? To pray. Secondly, that's the attitude, to be thankful. Third, already is there, to ask. So you got the three A's, right? First A is what? Take action. Pray. Second A is what? Uh, the attitude of thanksgiving. Third A is ask God. Fourth one doesn't quite work. <laughs> Believe me, I tried. It just didn't work, so we'll just go with, we got to wait on the Lord, right? We have to wait on God's peace. Do you know how many times Rhonda and I did not make a decision because one of us didn't have peace? And there were times it was really frustrating, like, wow, we're waiting on this and we need to make a decision. I, honey, I don't have peace. We're praying, we're really, we're praying. But I don't have peace. Do you know what? I never regretted any decision we didn't make because we were waiting on God. Because that's really what you do. You wait on the Lord. You wait on God. Isn't that what we're told in Isaiah 40? To wait on the Lord, right? Isn't that what is compounding throughout the Word of God about our relationship with God as we wait on the Lord? And then finally, to think on to think on the things of God, the things that are good, the things that are lovely, the things that are pure, to think on those things. All right, 12.15 is going to come again quickly, so i got to get really quick to this analysis. This is important. The analysis is amazing because Jesus then tells them why they shouldn't be so set on, I need to know about tomorrow. I need to know if that tree is going to fall, right? <laughs> I need to know that. And, 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 you know, again, we get caught up in that. And, and, and Jesus says, for after all these things the Gentiles seek. Now, I just got to parse out that word seek for you a little bit, all right? It, it actually is a compound word. It means on or upon. In other words, it's mainly translated um, hundreds of times as on. And then the other word is seek. It's used about 121 times as a separate word to seek. It's the same word, seek is the same word we find in Matthew 6, 33, which we'll look at in two weeks. So I won't spend time on that. I'll just mention it. But Clark points out that the idea of on seeking, get it? On seeking has the idea of intensely seeking. The Gentiles intensely seek what? What they're going to wear, what they're going to drink, what they're going to do, what that's going to happen tomorrow. What's, they're, they're, they're intent on that. Jesus is saying, it shouldn't be us. And, and I confess, oh God, I confess my guilt. I confess that sometimes I get caught up in the worrying process. But I'm so thankful for the word of God to point me back to the fact that that's what the unbeliever does, folks. That's what the heathen does. That's what the Gentile does is what Jesus is saying. For after all these things Gentiles seek. Now, this word is used only five times, and two times it's used about seeking for a sign. Twice it's used about seeking for a sign. I have the text up there. And Jesus says, an evil, or in chapter 16, so they're both in, in Matthew, in, an evil or a wicked generation, what? Adult, you know, let me read this again, I'm getting mixed up. And evil and adulterous generation seeks for what? A sign. I spent a lot of time thinking about that. <clears throat> what sign do you see? Like, haven't you ever just said, God, let me know? When God says, I already know, don't worry. And you come back and say, God, let me know. And God says, I already know, stop worrying. You say, but God, let me know. We're doing the same thing. We're asking God for a sign. 
Now, there are times where God does reveal to us, and that's vitally important. Now, I'm not negating that. I'm just saying that worrying about the sign. Secondly, the sign eliminates in the context that Jesus is talking about them because they're saying, give us a sign. He done all those miracles. He done all that teaching, and they're still asking for what? A sign. And, and, and that's what we often do with God. It's like, God, I, I'm in a real pickle. Show me something. And God says, I showed you that time. Three months ago, that time, eight months ago, that time. You, you see, isn't God faithful? Doesn't he show us? And, and, and we forget. We forget that there are signs. Like I said, the second part of this compound word, that's only used five times, the second part is used quite often, 121 times. And that's the word to seek. But seek first the kingdom of God. And we'll look at that in two weeks. The idea of seek and you will find. Or, let's go back to the context of Matthew 6. In Matthew 6, in verse 7 and 8, it says, And when you pray, oh, we were just talking about prayer, weren't we? And when you pray, don't try to deal with your worry about, I'll just keep praying until the worry goes. No, that, that's, that's very similar to this. And when you pray, do not use vain repetition as the heathens do, for they think that they will be heard by their many what? Their words. I've always had an issue, and, and, and you know, I understand sometimes uh, we have people that are very dear to us that are, that, that are embracing Catholicism, but I always felt like the rose, you know, the rosemary, you know, the you know, groceries, you know, it's just that rep repetition. You know, go, go again, go again, go again. There's a danger of that, Jesus is saying. Why? Because prayer is about my relationship with God. Prayer is me talking to God. His word is about him talking to me. And that relationship is what's important. The intimacy of that relationship is what is important. So he goes on to say, therefore, do not be like them. And then we'll get to the last part of that verse as we close. But real quickly here, some application. When it comes to worry, how should we be different from unbelievers? First of all, we wait on the Lord. We're not impatient. When we're truly living as a, uh, as a believer, we're, we're not impatient. We know that the Lord knows, and so we patiently wait on the Lord. Secondly, we watch for His direction. You can't just say, wait, Lord, when you do your thing, you know, let me know. No. You wait, but watch. That's a really important concept. You don't just passively wait. You actively wait by watching for His direction. And then finally, that requires us to walk, to walk in his ways. Now, I wish I had more time because the answer is amazing. The answer to our worry is just an amazing truth from the word of God. For your heavenly father knows. Do you ever understand the concept of knowing? You want to understand the omniscience. God is om. Omnipotent, that means all-powerful, right? God's omnipresent, that means he can be here and in every church <laughs> and with every individual <laughs> at the same time. But God is also omniscient, the three omnis. And you know what? I think omniscient kind of gets the lower end of things. <laughs> we like the omnipotent power of God. <laughs> you know, we like the omnipresent, he's able to be here with me in a personal way. But what would it be like to have a God who could be with you, who God was all-powerful, but God who had error in his thinking? The omniscient God has no <laughs> error in his thinking. He is omniscient. Listen to Psalm 139. I just put Psalm 139 because I jumped all over the text. But you have searched me and know me. You know my sitting down. You understand my thought. You comprehend my path. You are acquainted with all, not just some, all my way. How precious are your thoughts to me, more in number than the sand. Do you ever try to figure out how much sand there is? Do you know, do you know in a cubic foot of sand, they'd actually... Some people try to count the grains of sand in a cubic <laughs> foot, one foot, right? One cubic foot. The estimate, I looked over num numerous different, the estimate is 30 million. 30 million grains of sand in one cubic foot.
foot. I was amazed about that. Uh, University of Hawaii did a study. They did a study of all the beaches. So that's just the beaches. That's not underneath the beaches where the waves are and all that. That's just all the beaches of the world. And they try to calculate the depth of the sand and the width of the sand on beaches and calculate how many grains of sand there were. First of all, the calculation is kind of impossible to know. Uh, but it came out to something like that. <laughs> you get it? What is it? What is it? Uh, for that, I'll actually have to look at my notes. <laughs> um, I'm gonna, I know the sex, sextillion is coming up in a second. I'll give that to you. Um, it's a quintillion. Yeah, so... 7.5 quintillion. Does that sound right? Yeah. <laughs> we have a mathematician right here. So I always have to check with her. But look at all those zeros. That's just the grains of sand. Do you know what? That's not, that doesn't even compare. That doesn't even compare to how many stars there are. And we're not even talking about the sand in the desert and you know, all the other sand. You know, and, and you know what David says? God's thoughts to me. Right? How precious are your thoughts to what? To David. Way more than that, folks. I started doing calculations. Like, how, how many, how many, um, you know, how many seconds are there in a year, you know, because of God's thoughts and you know, it's, it's 80, you know, uh, uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's a little over 30 million, so it's about the amount of the one square of, of sand, you know. And then the, you just think of the amazingness of God. Do you know that in, in 10 drops of water, there's probably more molecules than there are in, the, there are stars in the sky? In just 10 drops? In fact, one drop of water has 1.67 sextillion, that's 1.67 with 21 zeros. Mm -hmm. The six seven would be part of it. In, in, in one drop, one drop, that is how complex and amazing a God we have. God is omniscient and our problems held in insignificance to the fact that his thoughts are like the grains of the sand coming toward each one of us. That's how great the omniscience of God is. It's just, it's unfathomable that not just toward David God could have those thoughts, but to David, to Kathy, to Peggy, to, 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 to Dick and, you know, and, and Judy, and each one of you here. It's just an amazing truth should empower us. And then Jesus says, you know what? And he knows that you need all these things. He already knows you need clothes. He already knows you need some food to drink. Food, food to eat and food, um, water to drink. <coughs> he already knows that. He already knows what you need. We looked last week at the whole idea of he shall supply your need. It's the same root. Uh, this word is, is, isn't used very often, but it's the context of, of need. And, you know, if somebody has a need and they're persistent, you'll meet their need. That was the Luke text. But for the sake of time, I'd like to just kind of move, just zip through here and come back to Matthew 6. Remember Matthew 6, verse 7, don't pray like the heathens, right? Mm -hmm. They think by their many words they're going to be heard. So the more words, they're, they're, trying to, they're trying to treat God like a higher human being. Like somebody who's really, really smart. You ever know someone who's really, really smart and you think, well, I'll treat them this way. That's how people are trying to treat God. Not treating God like he's omniscient. Like he has 7.5. What's that? Was quintillion. quintillion. Yes, it was quintillion. <laughs> quintillion thoughts. <laughs> and that's just, that, that doesn't even count as much as it could count. You know, that, that's forgetting who God is. That's treating like the heathens are treating God like, like he's just like a superhuman being, not omniscient. And, and, and so, therefore, do not be like them. Remember we just read that? For your father, what? Knows the things that you have need of even before you ask. 
That's the kind of God we have. And so in closing, I'd like us to really wrestle with how should our understanding of God's omniscience concerning, concerning everything in our life, but also concerning our needs impact our anxiety. What kind of impact should that have? You know, the first thing that I really want us to wrestle with is just the knowledge that if, if God is omniscient, he knows better. There have been times where, where I just struggled with, God, why are you doing this? And, and I have to remember, God, you are omniscient. You do know better. And with the fact that God knows better, it means I need to rely on him. I need to rely on him. When I worry, I need to remember, God, you know better. Help me to rely on you. Not only does, does God know better, but God's got it figured out. He's got all of it figured out. If he has that many thoughts, if he thinks that much about you, trust me, and he knows everything that's going to happen, he's got it figured out. <coughs> that's my biggest problem. I'm the ducks in the road kind of guy. <laughs> I want to figure it out. And how many times God has to just knock the ducks all out of a row and say, you can't put them back. You're just going to. And this is the second point. You're just going to have to trust me. You're just going to have to really trust me, Jim. Rely that I know. Trust. Trust that I can take care of it. And finally, folks, that takes faith that he will take care of us. To really believe, let's believe him rather than worrying about it. Let's really believe that's faith. That's faith in an omniscient God. You know, when we see all these truths... That simple statement, the Father knows, the Father knows, becomes so meaningful in our battle against worry and sets us up for in two weeks when we look and understand, now what does it mean to seek first the kingdom as a result of having this kind of great God to address our worry? Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word, its power to us, its significance to us. We're just so grateful for, for what you've given to us in your word to help us to not only understand, but to help us to have a life in the midst of what would cause most people deep worry. And help us to embrace this for your glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.